Two hours after Yamato sank came the belated order from the headquarters of the combined fleet. Call off the attack, pick up survivors and head for Sasebo. It is good that the chief of staff did not go back on his pledge to take emergency action to bring the operation to an end. But by the time all the ships had completed their rescue operations, the evening mist had settled over the ocean battleground. That was inevitable. With the end of the special attack mission in my ears, I take no joy in having come back from the very brink of death. Death is still close by. It is life, not death, which involves pain, and the conquest of self. The pain from exhaustion and swallowed oil is severe, and I run a fever. The chills don't stop. I go to the officers' quarters, collapse onto a bunk and fall asleep, one of a pile of sleepers. Now hear this, crew of Yamato. All able-bodied men assist in the operation of this vessel. Barking at us, Lieutenant Yamamori, Yamato's hot-blooded assistant navigation officer. I crawl to the bulkhead and with difficulty pull myself erect. My face is a study in chagrin and frustration. Aye, aye, respond voices nearby. But that is all. I see no one actually moving. I know full well that those who have been rescued should help out, but my arms and legs refuse to do my bidding. While in the water, one sailor saw Ensign Mori, aid to the captain. So Mori escaped the murky depths at the sinking, but still did not make it. He who longed with his whole heart to die, who prayed that his fiancée would find a new life. He followed the road to death, unerringly, to its end. He was an expert swimmer, but perhaps his uniform was too heavy, or his wounds too severe. Did he die in the line of duty, utterly intent in his warm-hearted way, on rescuing the sailors at the side of the ship, encouraging them, scolding them? How did he challenge death, fight with death, finally attain death? In so doing, did he bring his life to completion, ennoble himself? For the vanquished, it is a difficult road that leads from here to Sasebo. The crack American submarines, eager to feast on wounded destroyers, wait for us at several points, all night long they attack us persistently from the rear. As if in a nightmare, I hear the buzzer incessantly calling the men to their stations, the submarine alert resounding through the ship. It is said that when the crewmen of this ship walk through the passageways, the wounded men lying there reach up from the floor, grab their legs and plead, please get us back safely to Japan. Moreover, damage to the instruments on the bridge is extensive and casualties among officers and men are heavy. It is no easy matter to run the ship, but with indomitable fighting spirit and a deep sense of responsibility, and with these alone, they carry on the hard fight. A last resort when one is encircled by enemy submarines is to shine searchlights on the nearest sub, fire ranging shots that force it to submerge, and then flee through the gap. I understand we performed that desperate manoeuvre repeatedly. Four torpedo tracks to starboard, Voices reporting such messages pierce my ears as I lie in torment. Almost delirious, I mutter, OK, this time I'm not going to swim. Look, I'll really die. This is how things go right up till dawn. Yukikaze did take two torpedoes, but fortunately neither exploded, so she escaped harm. The remnants of the task force of the ten ships of the special task force for the thrust against Okinawa, only four ships are still functioning. Fuyutsuki, Suzutsuki, Yukikaze, and Hatsushimo. More than half the task force is gone. Kasumi and Isokaze both took damage to their engines and are dead in the water. If left that way, they will be captured by the Americans, and it will be impossible to prevent a breach of security. There is no alternative but to sink them with our own torpedoes. Entrusted with the task, Fuyutsuki heads for Kasumi. The time for lying alongside is five minutes, and during that time a great stream of officers and men files across the two gangplanks fixed between the ships. The officers all throw away their battle caps and wear their uniform caps. With official documents in hand and swords at their side, they salute the ship they are abandoning and come on board. The junior officers and men stand in formation and wait their turn, or they hurry across carrying the wounded piggyback. When five minutes are up, the gangplanks are knocked away simultaneously, even as men are still to be seen on board Kasumi. We immediately pull away, and after the courtesy to the ship of one leisurely circuit around her, we finish her off expertly with a single torpedo, precisely placed. After the enemy task force withdrew, Yukikaze headed for Isokaze and carried out the same procedure. As for Suzutsuki, 
Her commissioned officers and warrant officers have all been killed or wounded, and a senior petty officer has taken command. Moreover, her engines and boiler are damaged. She cannot move forward. She signals Fuyutsuki by blinker, heading toward Kagoshima in reverse. Later, having succeeded with desperate emergency repairs, she makes instead for Sasebo, farther away. Fuyutsuki is in the best condition. The 8th of April morning, we make port at Sasebo. Yukikaze and Hatsushimo make port slightly later, at noon of the same day. Suzutsuki enters the harbour still later, about dusk, stern aflame and on the point of sinking. She enters the dry dock in that condition. Tales told by some of those rescued executive officer Nomura of Yamato was rescued by Yukikaze's boat. He is past his prime but still lean. He is the sole survivor from the damage control station far below deck. How was he able to escape? On a special attack mission, the captain's death in battle is inevitable. The extremely important reports on the battle, the winding up of the affairs of the ship, and all such responsibilities fall to the executive officer. No matter how difficult the situation, he must return alive. When at last he reached the rescue boat, he was exhausted indeed, about to go under, but seeing the captain's insignia on his uniform, the rescue crew quickly pulled him out. They say that he was already utterly done in, that he was completely unconscious, and that they struck him repeatedly to keep him alive as they hurried back to the ship. He has a long bullet wound from his forehead to the back of his head. Ensign Kamata, the officer in charge of the machine guns at the very stern of Yamato, fights bravely until nearly the end of the battle. But when his guns take a bomb hit and stop functioning, he gathers all the men of his squad at the base of the turret. He distributes some candy and hands around a cigarette, gift of the Emperor, for each man to take a puff. Aware somehow that there is something still to be done, he becomes conscious of his need to urinate. Ascertaining that his men all have the same thing on their minds, he laughs loudly, lines them up at the railing, and together they urinate into the ocean. Then he has them stand shoulder to shoulder and sends them flying into the water. He himself, intent upon seeing all his men off for the final time, is two or three paces behind them. Perhaps for this reason he alone is flung up rather than down by the propeller, which is revolving at slow speed. Six metres in diameter, the propeller pulls all the sailors under in an instant, but then, with its upward thrust, it picks him up and sends him flying out of its whirlpool. A fearsome, enormous thing pressed right in before my eyes, and the next instant I fainted. That is his recollection. He received a cut extending from his right shoulder to the left side of his belly, but his clothes were thick and the wound fortunately shallow. He got away with only a slight infection. The coxswain of Hatsushimo's rescue boat says with a sigh, There was one guy who clung to the side of the boat and just would not let go, so we had no choice but to pull him up. He wasn't conscious of what he was doing, and we had to really work on him. The man in question was Lieutenant Imoto, chief of the fire control division of Yamato. On reaching Hatsushimo, Lieutenant Imoto was carried to the sick bay, apparently dead. After two hours of artificial respiration, he finally revived. But they say his agony was unbearable to see. He had an injury received in the water and compression of the chest, both from the force of Yamato's explosion. He had already been left adrift and had survived several times. Six months earlier, while he was serving in the South Pacific Theatre as a senior officer of a destroyer, his ship had come under heavy bombing and had sunk. But he transferred the majority of his crew to a raft that stood ready on deck, drifted and awaited rescue by a friendly ship. Happening to encounter one of our coast defence ships in full flight, he had her come alongside while he transferred to her his entire crew. Immediately sending his men to battle stations, he himself went up to the bridge and, ignoring the captain, took over command of the ship and her guns. With great spirit and skill, he got the ship out of danger and back to port. By nature forceful, quick and enthusiastic, he goes straight to the heart of things. A gunnery officer picked up by Hatsushimo's rescue boat divulges the following tale. The rescue boat soon has a full load of sailors plucked from the water, and as they keep adding to the load, the situation becomes dangerous. If she picks up still more men, she can't avoid capsizing with everyone going to the bottom. Nevertheless, more and more hands cling to the side of the boat. Their grip is strong, and the boat's list reaches the point that something must be done. 
At this juncture, the boat's coxswain and petty officers draw the swords they have ready, and free the boat by cutting the competing arms off at the wrist, or by kicking the men away. It is a last resort, taken in the hope of saving those already in the boat. Still, for the rest of their lives they will see the faces, the eyes of those who, hands chopped off, give up all resistance, throw back their heads and sink out of sight. And those who wield the swords, too, hurry around the boat, faces pale, soaked with sweat, panting, a scene of living hell. One extraordinary happening is attested to by many survivors as with one voice. During the period the destroyer was dead in the water to rescue survivors, a single American reconnaissance seaplane intentionally circled over our heads. Those in the water were not sure, but many of the crew of the destroyer remember an uncanny silence as the plane circled at an extremely low altitude. The ability to dash about in any direction is the very life of a destroyer, as soon as she comes to a complete stop, she is extremely vulnerable. It would have been like shooting fish in a barrel to attack the destroyer from low in the sky. But the enigmatic circling of the reconnaissance plane acted as an absolute protective wall, sheltering us from being stormed by the fighter planes and bombers waiting at higher altitudes. The hostility of the American forces to Yamato has always been intense. In this operation, too, their aim of annihilating us completely was clear from their torpedo attacks, their strafing with machine guns, and their follow-up attacks on the men in the water. Therefore, it is hard to conceive that the protective action of this reconnaissance plane was based either on orders from the command plane or on humanitarian considerations. With the immense sky and ocean as our stage, we and the crew of the American plane were fellow warriors who had used every trick of the trade in carrying out our duties. Launching a fatal attack against a rescue ship in her extreme vulnerability must have been something their instincts as warriors would not permit. They were elite warriors, the Chosen. It was beneath them to defile the final scene of the war between Japan and America. Their true motive is apparent in the fact that as soon as the work of rescuing survivors came to an end, they immediately moved to chase and attack us with great tenacity. The 8th of April, morning. Having slept one night, I have entirely recovered my strength. The temperature and sick feeling have gone away, but my eyes give me terrible pain. I cannot open them easily. Going out on deck, I wash my face. The jet black of my skin has not faded in the slightest. We even laugh at one another's grotesque appearance. The ship is already running along the west coast of Kyushu. Sunlight pours into my eyes. The hills of home are sparklingly beautiful. An involuntary sigh. All the same, it's good to be alive. Still, these bright colours of spring, set against the deaths of countless comrades in arms, make me ashamed that I am still alive. I comfort myself with the thought that returning alive was not our idea, that it was the result of luck. But one nagging question will not go away. Was it right that we should have been saved? We enter Sasebo Harbour. As we drop anchor, an air attack is in progress against some of the factories of the naval port. Expressionless, we watch the black smoke. All Yamato crew assemble. It has been a long time since we last heard that order. Some of us wear tattered uniforms, some are wrapped in blankets, and some are half-naked. A procession of ghosts and goblins Assistant Gunnery Officer Shimizu glares around at us and speaks. You look at ease, insolent, as if you'd just accomplished a pretty tough piece of work. Why should that be? That battle wasn't such a big deal. From now on, you veterans will be all the more in demand. Soon, perhaps even this very moment, you will follow me to the attack. Okay? The gaze is pouring in on him, the gloomy silence. The fatigue from our trip to death's door is too great. That same night, we enter a branch hospital outside Sasebo Naval Base. Located on an isolated island to prevent breaches of security, it is a facility for the treatment of injuries. Bodies clothed in white, a ward reverberating the whole night through with the sound of waves. In the night air fragrant with flowers, we have much to think about. Spring at its height and a long, leisurely convalescence are too tame somehow for us to accept. The slightly wounded all petition the commanding officer of the hospital, and we are permitted to leave the hospital even though our treatment is not yet completed. We proceed to Kur and find innumerable letters from home awaiting us, but almost all the addressees are dead. Sorting the letters and returning them to the senders, a heart-rending task. 
At the Cure Personnel Department, we ask about new assignments. The Executive Officer. Luckily or unluckily, we survived. We will find better places to die. Anyone have anything to add? As if wishing to quell pangs of conscience for having survived, we petition blindly for special attack duty. Our requests are granted, and we are posted again to special attack units. Granted survivors leave, I set off for an unexpected trip home. On the way, I send a telegram. My last testament has already arrived, so father and mother may have become reconciled to my death. Please get ready to be happy. I arrive home. Father, with no outward show of emotion. Here, I'll pour you a drink. Mother, with quiet excitement, works diligently on a feast into which she pours her love. My telegram, seen by chance in the letter rack, so soaked with tears that the letters have lost their shape. Did I truly know that she would be so beside herself with grief at my death? Did I know how absolutely selfless she was? That being the case, did I know how precious life is? How despicable the slightest pride in having seen actual combat? My experience of those few days, call it a special attack sortie. These slender reflections, a harvest gained by venturing into the realm of death and returning alive. No, not one of us in 10,000 expected to return alive. I did not choose death of my own free will. Rather, death seized me. There is no easier death. It is not a death of the spirit. It is a death of the flesh. It is not the death of a human being. It is the death of an animal. Indeed, it is not death, but only a small taste of death. Did I look death in the face for even a single moment? After we sailed, did I ever scrutinise myself closely, as one should on the brink of death? In the last moments, did I have even the slightest sense that life was worth living? I do not know death. I have not come into contact with death. What spared me a confrontation with death, I see now, was the extraordinariness of battle, and my sorrow for those who were dying, and the clearly adverse fortunes of the homeland. Consider by way of contrast the deaths of those on the home front, the deaths of the countless victims of the war. What would have happened if I on the bridge had had fathers and mothers living nearby as they did? If brothers and sisters, what then? What would have happened if I had had opportunity to escape? Room for choice, independence, responsibility. What if I had been living a life of misery? What if I had been merely a worthless sacrifice? Death in a special attack is far easier. No one put in my position would have acted any differently. That would hold true for all. Old people, infants, children, women. The road to an inevitable death is broad and smooth. Death itself is a commonplace, a matter of course. We ought to revere death solely because it is natural just as we revere nature. If so, ask about our experience, not on the grounds that we faced certain death. Ask rather, how did we discharge our duties? Did we act unerringly? Did I really do my part? Did I look death in the face in the line of duty? No. Didn't I submit to death quite willingly? Didn't I cloak myself in the proud name of special attack and find rapture in the hollow of death's hand? Yes. That and no other was the reason for my cold and callow behaviour. Was I diligent in my everyday duties? Did I act with utmost sincerity in my every action? Did I do my best at every moment? On all these points I was negligent. And yet, callow and negligent though I was, this testing was conferred upon me. For what reason? Should I be grateful for my good fortune in once having death bestowed on me? Or should I be grateful for my good luck in having death snatched away from me? Had I turned back at that moment, in that instant of confused struggle at the twilight crossroads, what then? What awaited me? Death? So dark, painful, destitute, death beyond doubt, no matter, that which set me apart from so many shipmates and bathed me once more in the light of day. What was it? An end to thinking. Death has nothing to do with me. When it was close to me, death paradoxically receded, only when one has lived out one's life in peace and tranquility can one come face to face with death. Living a constant and sincere life, there is no other path to a direct confrontation with death. Make of yourself an empty vessel. Make of this moment a turning point toward a life of constancy and dedication. In the end, this operation was not a success. We lost more than half the task force and turned back when we were only halfway there. From the commander-in-chief of the combined fleet came words of appreciation. Thanks to the sacrificial bravery of this task force, our special attack planes had great success. 
The air assault Kikusui Wa of 6, the 7th of April, in concert with Operation Tenichigo, was a major action involving the launching of a total of 700 planes, most of which were involved in kamikaze operations. However, the American forces knew ahead of time that our surface forces would have no air cover, hence they could keep their powerful squadrons of fighter planes near Okinawa. Moreover, our forces did not achieve close coordination of land and sea operations. Thanks to their success and our failure, our losses amounted to more than 350 planes shot down or damaged. On the other side of the losses reported by the American forces, I understand that most of the 30 ships damaged were damaged only slightly and that only three destroyers were sunk. After the whole operation was over, the Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet sent this message to the entire Navy. In the early part of April 1945, our naval special attack is forces carried out a resolute attack, unparalleled in its ferocity, against enemy forces in the vicinity of Okinawa. This action greatly enhanced the traditions of the Imperial Navy and the glory of our surface units. Many brave men, the commander-in-chief of the task force in the fore, laid down their lives in the noble cause of defending the Empire. Their utter sincerity in serving the country goes straight to our hearts, and their unswerving loyalty will shine through the ages. I hereby acknowledge their meritorious deeds and notify the entire navy. Yamato sank, and her giant lies shattered 200 miles northwest of Tokunoshima, 430 meters down, 3,000 corpses still entombed today. What were their thoughts as they died?